It's Wednesday, March 10th. This is going to be the business section and a little bit of social. But uh, yeah, it's the 10th, so the business news is going to be in 10th. Let's just let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> just let the fumes come off of that one. For a <laughs> Let's start off with talking about something that you're probably not going to be able to get. Because, of course, everything's in short supply right now, and everybody wants a new video card. AMD reveals the Radeon RX 6700 XT, a 1440p gaming powerhouse. We literally know nothing about it other than AMD slides. AMD has had a pretty good, pretty honest track record for the slides and all of the other information. Availability, a little less so, but fortunately, uh, <laughs> I think they've got a pretty good deflection in that nobody has good availability of anything. But it looks like this card is gonna, or this card is gonna come in at a pretty reasonable price point, at least initially, if you can actually buy them and the miners don't buy them and, and blah, blah, blah. AMD, for its part, said that it's doing everything it can to work directly with retailers like Micro Center, which means that, you know, your big purchase, like, miner farms, I guess, will be at a disadvantage to buy these cards, but ultimately money's money, and I don't think it really matters. Or they could find some homeless people, give them $10, have them go buy cards. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to, uh, you know, buying, like, maybe we could get a loan and buy, like, 100,000 of these and set up a thing on the level one store. And then, uh, you know, it's like, you here's your, what's your gamer application? Are you a card-carrying member of the, uh, the, uh, the, the PC Gamer Nation? All right, then we'll sell you a card. <laughs> You've added... Like <laughs> six man hours to every sale. Yeah. <laughs> That's the margin isn't even that high. It's like the the uh, the amount of you know insanity that you go through to get like a you know like a a security clearance or background check is just a tiny fraction of what you go through to purchase a video card. That would be funny. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see that. I think we're just going to continue to suffer until, and that, you know that's a a big question is like. If the cryptocurrencies crash, that fixes that. But now it destroys like giant companies because everybody's investing in it all of a sudden. <laughs> I uh, I thought the, the the one of the other technical aspects I thought was interesting was that AMD's positioning here is that twelve gigabytes of VRAM. I mean, it is a differentiator, but um, you know, in their testing, they were saying, oh, you know, look at all this, whatever. But you know, I don't know. It's more chips that might be in short supply. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Does does everybody run their games at Ultra? I mean, couldn't you just turn the textures down? I, I, maybe it's just, you know, like, because I'm old and I'm not as into gaming as I used to be, but I don't care. <laughs> My old eyes can't see the difference between Ultra and High. <laughs> I The frame rate matters to me, but the fidelity and, like, I'm going to turn off a lot of the extra stuff anyway because it's so, like... Games are just an explosion of color in your face these days. <laughs> I can definitely remember 19-year-old me being completely satisfied with like 35 FPS. And now I'm like, it's falling below 90. This is unacceptable. <laughs> I mean, remember Half-Life. Because Half-Life <laughs> yeah. was like more colorful than any game we'd ever seen before. And it was just mostly brown. <laughs> we were fine with it. The world is mostly brown. <laughs> if you are shopping for a new TV, maybe you're going to spend your uh, stimulus money to get that hot new TV, you're going to be uh, met with so many buzzwords and catchphrases and different kinds of technology. And they're trying to tell you like, there's no standards. It's ridiculous. And Samsung, they're going to add two more. Samsung will soon ship micro LED TVs, but many LED TVs still lead the lineup. This is Samsung's answer to OLED. They're trying to make little tiny LEDs. These are probably good for TVs. I don't think these are very good for monitors. But they also, they call them like Neo QLED or something like that. It's just ridiculous. They're just making stuff up. But they're coming. And uh, they're pretty expensive. Some of these only, they're only selling really big ones. Well, it's because making a small LED is hard. And the small LED is comparatively large compared to OLED. So that's the thing. If you're in the market for that. Also, a rumor, but a hot one. Oh, this would shake the world up, wouldn't it? No one cares. <laughs> no one cares. Actually, a lot of people care, but I don't care about those people. Yeah. That's what's important. The Verge reports that a folding iPhone could be coming in 2023. God help us, what have we become? You know this is going to be a hot selling, right? 
<laughs> this is going to be huge. Apple finally gets the foldable formula right is going to be the headline. So they are saying that this is going to be basically an iPad mini that folds in half. So not the clamshell that some of the other people are going with, but like the phablet transformer thing. You think they'll have screens on the outside? They'll probably have like indicators or LEDs or something. Apple will want to cut the cost of the device so that the margin is at least 100%. So it seems like they wouldn't go for a, an LCD screen on the outside, but maybe maybe something really basic, like one of those, uh, uh, you know, like e- e-ink displays or something that doesn't use like any the power. Watch. Yeah. Here's the big question. They didn't say, obviously. I'm gonna guess twenty twenty two fifty. Oh, no, no. the runaway inflation by then? Five grand. <laughs> <laughs> Five grand. Will that be after the 18th stimulus? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a loaf of bread is $500, but we all have the five grand. <laughs> However, if you are thinking about getting that, uh, that beautiful folding iPhone, and the thing about Apple, obviously, if you buy into the Apple nonsense, you pretty much have to buy in all the way. You want to go full Apple to get all that connectivity. You want to make your whole life revolve around Apple. But here's a cautionary tale of doing that. Here's somebody who adapted everything Apple into their life, including the Apple credit card. And then... Apple disabled my iCloud, App Store, and Apple ID accounts about 10 days ago when I went to update apps from any App Store on the Mac. Oh, as a developer. I was met with a curious error. Basically, Apple canceled him. And then the blog is like, I heard about this happening on Google, but I was in the ivory tower of Apple. How could this happen to me? And then he goes on to run you through the rat race (laughs) of trying to talk to a human being at Apple. He did not succeed. It was updated to let you know that he had moved forward a little bit, but had not gotten his account back yet. This is one of those things where like, you email Tim Cook. Like, I actually know somebody that bought one of those $80,000 Mac Pros and something wasn't right about it. And he'd gone through like three layers of tech support. And finally, he just emailed Tim Cook. And Tim Cook was like, all right, there's a new one on its way to you. And it was well, like, wow, how does that even happen? Remember that guy who bought stock so he could go to the stockholder meeting <laughs> yeah. and get tech support? That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. And uh, so this guy was shut out of his entire life. He couldn't get to his email to solve some of the other problems because he was locked out of his email because his card was no longer valid. It turned out he had uh, switched checking accounts. So he did not pay the bill, but they never gave him any indication of that was why he was blocked. None of the people he talked to on the phone knew. I, You know, I, I don't think that well, Kafka, I can't remember Kafka's first name. It was so prescient because this is like, oh, it's a Kafka nightmare. No, it literally is. Except now the human beings are not our oppressors anymore. Well, they kind of are. Well. I mean, they built this system. I think the person that's developing this system doesn't realize exactly how much human misery they're causing. Whereas, like, you know, in that, at least in that one psychological experiment, when you press the button, you can hear the person screaming for the other room. Maybe not (laughs) the guy, maybe not the developer. You're probably right about that. I think Tim Cook knows. Yeah. Certainly the people at Google know, especially after the AI story. Oh, foreshadowing. The developer is the one suffering the metamorphosis. <laughs> and maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't know why. <laughs> if you hear all of that and you say to yourself, Dear God, how do I escape this system? I need to communicate, but everything you say makes me fear all of these companies. Well, the obvious answer is the Linode link in the bottom, but that ad is for the news tomorrow. But they don't sell mobile. (laughs) So you have to get a phone somewhere else. Somewhere. Maybe this is a choice. Google Free EOS now selling preloaded phones in the U.S. starting at $380. This is Lineage OS, basically, I think. That was my takeaway of this. I would love to have a little bit more technical under the hood details. Lineage, Lineage OS really deserves a lot of the credit here for this because what Google gave you with the no Google Android was actually really just a prop. It was not actually useful by itself. The real heroes are the people that have put the work into that to make it actually honestly usable. Boiler Snake agrees. He's got one of these. He loves it. Maybe he'll let me do a review on it. <clears throat> he won't let me touch it. So, uh, the thing about this is, you know, obviously you load this on an old phone, 
But now they will sell you a refurbished Samsung S9 with this already on it for 380. Nothing but used phones. They can't sell you new phones, obviously. But they claim that these used phones are very well reconditioned. Neat. So, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to try one of those out. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm willing to... Although the S9 is not that bad of a phone. I mean, how old is it now? It's actually still surprisingly good. It's like three and a half years old. Yeah. I could probably live with that. <clears throat> Gabru and the other woman who nobody knows her name, unfortunately, because she came second. That's how it works, folks. The first man on the moon, everybody knows his name. Second man, eh. But uh, she continues to be very vocal about this thing. And she happens to serve on the boards of a lot of these uh, big ethics committees. And also, a lot of these big ethics committees get money from Google. That's a bit of a conflict. AI Ethics Research Conference suspends Google sponsorship. So this is an ACM conference or an ACM affiliated conference, the Association for Computing Machinery. It's like it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of prestigious. Yeah, they don't want anything to do with Google. Now they didn't say forever, but they said for now they were going to reevaluate. Yeah. So I think this this gives the opportunity for Google to do something high profile to say how they're revamping their internal AI structure, but there's something definitely rotten in Denmark. Oh, there's no question about that. Uh, she gave a statement, and the other one that got fired gave a statement because they're both part of this whole thing, and they're basically saying, yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to have ethics, we can't have Google funding it. But I bet that was a lot of money they're going to be out of. So we'll see. Now, one thing Google is doing that on the surface seems like it's good for the people is getting rid of third-party cookies. Who can argue with that? Nobody. A beautiful thing to do, but they are replacing it with their own thing, and you got to question that a little bit. Google has plowed ahead with their plan to curb how ads track users. So it's not going to be cookies anymore. You're going to be automatically placed in a cohort bucket. A flock. A flock, yeah. Uh, and advertisers are not happy with this because it takes a lot of control that they had you know, sort of out of their hands. With products like Snowplow and Blue Kai, you could kind of get at some of the data that you were collecting on your properties. Yes, in some cases, you may be sharing this data. In some cases, you may not be sharing this data. But uh, it doesn't really... It doesn't really solve the fundamental problem of um, your traffic and your data is being analyzed and categorized and all these little metrics and performance vectors are being assigned to you as an individual. And it's no one is sure yet because we don't know exactly what this looks like technically, but a lot of people have pointed out a lot of ways that this probably falls apart under the onslaught that the advertising community will hit it with in yeah. terms of trying to identify you based on your flock. Google's flock is a terrible idea. So this is from the EFF. And the EFF does a pretty good job here, I think, of walking us through the most likely doomsday scenario with this. And ultimately, my takeaway from this is that Flock takes even more control out of the advertiser's hands and puts even more control in Google's hands because only they really know what's going on with the advertising. Um, so ultimately, it's probably not good for advertisers, but it's ultimately going to cement more control of the situation in Google's hands. And we're trusting Google to act more ethically than advertisers, which is probably true right now. But I don't know if it's going to be true in five years. I don't know if I agree with that at all. I think the problem here is that we're we're painting this as advertisers bad, Google good. The yeah. truth is advertisers bad, Google also bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 the EFF article kind of goes into that details or into that aspect as well. It is bad or less bad or bad or worse or bad or bad, not bad or, oh, this is acceptable. There is kind of, I think there is something to the, well, is this what it takes to have a free internet or do we have to go to some sort of microtransaction, microcurrency system? And even, I don't even know if that is a true, you know, either or scenario. I don't the internet's not free. It's never been free. Well, I mean, yeah. You're not wrong. Yeah. So that's... Why chase that? 
That's not a re that's never going to be a reality. Intel has had a terrible, terrible <laughs> judgment against them. Bit bit of a setback. And uh, this, you know, it's it's tough to lose a settlement like that, lose a case like this. But it's really tough when you're talking about these kinds of numbers. Uh, Bloomberg has the article about Intel has been told to pay two point one eight billion dollars to what is now basically a patent holding company. Originally, the patent the patents were held by another company, and they were sold to this holding company that does nothing but litigate patents. But that wasn't enough for Intel to win their patent case here. The, I mean, the the copyright and the patent systems, like, I don't know how you fix them, but they have to be fixed. Yeah. Or just cut them back until you figure out a way to fix them. Because where we are now is... Good Lord. The uh, parlor saga continues. Now, there was the big argument all along about, you know, like, oh, the big tech companies, they're in control of everything. And everybody said, hey, you don't like it? Do your own thing. And a couple of companies did that. They might not have done it well, but Ooh, they did tried. it. They tried. And they were met at every turn with people trying to destroy them for doing what they were told. Reuters reports that uh, Parler has sued Amazon again, alleging an effort to destroy the application. So, I guess Parler is saying that they did actually have some controls and some of the stuff that Amazon complained about wasn't really applicable when they returned with their fixes or their versions or whatever. But ultimately, I think it, they're going to rule that Amazon has the right to do business with whomever they choose. I think a big part of this was their original case said that Amazon took them off the internet and they were unable to return to the internet. So they destroyed their business. But now they're back on the internet. Yeah. So they had to file an amended yeah. suit that changed what they complained about. Essentially, they're still trying to do the same thing. If Amazon can steal a camera bag with impunity, I don't think the parlor's going to win. It is a tough... I mean, the Amazon lawyers basically have an infinite budget. Yeah. And there's probably a lot of them. I don't know if the world needs Parler, but the world needs tech companies to not be destroyed by their rivals under the guise of, you know, like, hate. Yeah. I don't think we'll get that here. Netflix. One thing about Netflix is they are constantly, desperately trying to figure out what the youth of America wants to see. And that could be a tough thing to guess. We certainly don't know. But they're taking a stab in the dark. Netflix has added a Fast Laughs tab with comedy clips streaming in a TikTok-like feed. This seems a little dystopian. Now here's, uh, maybe Variety got this wrong. But they claim that they give you the LOL button, so you can see that here, where it just percolates up these, these laughing emojis. But I don't think it does anything else. Who is that for? Well, that's the thing. I don't do they track that, you think? <laughs> Probably. I don't think it like I don't think the videos have uh a user visible LOL count. What a bizarre world social media is. I just don't understand it. Another thing that I'm probably not very hip to is this new craze of low or no code languages. That seems to be the hotness right now. <laughs> and Microsoft is looking to get on that train. Microsoft launches PowerFX, a new open source low code language. So what? how this came about was they looked at how people were using Microsoft Excel. You know, Microsoft Excel is Turing complete. You could, you know, build an entire operating system in Microsoft Excel if you really wanted to. Uh, people have done some really incredible things with Microsoft Excel. So PowerFX is basically taking all those terrible things that people did with Microsoft Excel, extracting it from Excel, and making it available basically everywhere. And they're incorporating it in all their new products. This is supposedly going to be a way for normies to get things like this done without having to write any code. I mean, I would love all this, th these kinds of things if it wrote that configuration to a text file like Bash RC, and I could just copy that to different computers but as it is I'm gonna have to go through an elaborate UI pointing and clicking and arranging things just the way that I want just in time for the next feature update for Windows 10 to come in and clobber and delete all of my preferences I don't think the normies are gonna go for text files 
<laughs> Can you put some animations in that text file? <laughs> What about some flashing lights, <laughs> gifs, a text file that supports the gif format. Emojis, emojis. <laughs> you can do emojis right now in the in text files. Notepad totally supports emojis. It does. Yeah. Oh, you mean emotes or emojis? It, it supports uh, extended character sets and um, Unicode and the emoji character set. Wow, that's, ha- un- that's unnecessary. You have to get there by pasting, but it, you can do it. You can't do the alt and the codes. Uh, you can't you can't change the well. You might be able to if you change the default font, but mixing fonts is where that gets sketchy. Mm, okay. We're not there yet, folks, but maybe someday. And another place that we might be someday is back in the conference room. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. No one wants to go back to the conference <laughs> it's a dark, room. It's a dark place. I don't know if this would help or not. Microsoft's new intelligent speaker delivers its promised meeting room of the future. So this speaker is going to pair up with teams, figure out who's talking, provide great audio, and blah, blah, blah. I will say that that uh, on the Microsoft Teams interface, when it's like, how do you want audio? And you can do like room audio. This is what it's talking about. But uh, it does work really well. Like if you've got one of the Polycom Teams phones, it works surprisingly well. I think you have to have that puck for this one. Or yeah. they, they make one other product, the Surface one. I'm, works with it. I'm skeptical of it though because at some point it's going to be like Skype for Business where it had some pretty good inertia and then they just abandoned ship. Like they decided, oops, we got the architecture wrong and then it's just never been updated since then. Also, uh, automatic transcription and translation. How much of that's going back to the Microsoft server? All of it. Yeah. <laughs> the AI says that we need to invest in this company nobody's ever heard of before. I wonder why. It was because of the transcriptions. Here's a question I bet you don't have an answer to. What movie are you most excited about in 2021? Who knows what's coming out, right? Who cares about movies anymore? And it seems more and more that not only are people not going to the theaters, but they're just like, they're kind of burned out of this whole thing. They and are. yet, we're starved for entertainment. And so Disney, they're trying to figure it out. Disney CEO suggests there's no going back from where we are now in terms of film releases it's always going to be digital on demand they're just making too much money that piracy thing that wasn't really as nearly as blown out of proportion as they thought it was that this does prove false how many studies (laughs) and inflammatory papers yeah so they're saying we're not sure exactly what amount of time but we are sure that that whole like three (laughs) to six months after theatrical release nah we're not doing that anymore you know even with this we're still on a trajectory for like your home media playback server to require a blood sample before it will cooperate due to copyright law you gotta sing a disney song (laughs) sing song of the south in order to unlock the new episodes of road one okay so that's uh they one of the other companies that was AMC. They're looking at like a 14 day window and Disney won't say, but I think they are kind of looking at that like, well, yeah, maybe 14 days makes sense. Cause you probably do make most of your money in the theater there. They have some new movie coming out. That's like a big hit. I can't remember the name of it. Raya. Who cares? I don't know. Who don't Raya accidentally is. advertise for that. Linode pays good money for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of cross. Oh, those people have kids, I guess. That's the thing about Disney. Like, you telling people not to do it doesn't matter. It's the kids. <laughs> the kids drive that, and, you know, they'll make the parents miserable. Oh, and talking about making people miserable, what a great lead down. I didn't even mean to do that. But what's making you miserable every day? It's funny because we were just talking about this right before we started filming because Wendell was looking at his phone. Yeah. The New Yorker says that email is making us miserable. An attempt to work more efficiently, we've accidentally deployed an inhumane way to collaborate. All right, so I'm going to disagree with... I get what they're saying, and I agree with what they're saying. I don't think it's email. It's Teams and Slack. and well, Not everybody all, has that. All of that nonsense. No, no, see, it's like at some point, we've gone from, I have a task... This task is going to take more than a trivial amount of time. I am working on that task. To, I'm working on a task, but I am required to provide communication update to randos that pop up constantly that I am making progress on that task, which takes away from that task. Now, they're pointing out more about the fact that now that we are under this new paradigm, like we were talking about, who's going back to the conference room? And that's great. Not being in the conference room is great, but... 
it does blur the lines in terms of like when you're working and when you're not working. So they're saying we need rules to decide when it's okay for you to ignore your email. I think that it's not unreasonable to check your email, you know, twice a day. But some people like freak out. They're like, hey, I emailed you, you know, at five o'clock yesterday. It's eight o'clock the next morning. Why didn't you respond? And it's like, because you've only given me 12 working minutes to respond. If you went 12 hours without checking your email, we would have to tase you. (laughs) Well, not all email because there are certain there are certain classes of messages that I will not respond to uh, outside of regular hours. No, that makes sense. But some people don't have that choice. Yeah. yeah. So you're in a unique position. But uh, some people are, you know, you get your email from the boss. Especially like all those Japanese stories. Remember those Japanese stories we'd read? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning for a meeting. <laughs> so that's a corporate. It may not be policy, but it's expected in a lot of cases. And I think yeah. they want to create laws that will prevent that. Yeah. I don't know if we need laws to prevent that. There probably are. Don't you agree that there are some jobs where you should be checking your email? <laughs> yeah. If you uh, you know order a level one KVM, I will totally respond to your email at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> to try to help you figure out why your cables are bad. Well, one, maybe one profession where it makes sense to monitor your email all day long as well as other stuff on the internet because things can change fast is if you're running the goldman sachs cryptocurrency desk (laughs) you really have a job you don't have a job you want to keep your finger on the pulse once you let milton go he's not coming back so uh yeah uh definitely if you're gonna (laughs) be trying to get this job just get ready for that Goldman Sachs has restarted their cryptocurrency desk amid the Bitcoin boom, according to this article on Reuters. <sighs> what a, like, just, why would you, like, they can't make up their mind. They cannot make up their mind. Well, I think they really hate it, but at some point, their greed overcomes <laughs> whatever, you know, resistance they have to it. As it goes up and goes down those you know it crosses the threshold it crosses the zero point and goldman sachs and what they're really good at they're really good at buying it on the way up and selling it to their clients on the way down (laughs) just like silver then huh they are fantastic at that (laughs) they've gotten trouble for that with silver haven't they well when you say trouble (laughs) do you mean like give back one percent of the profits (laughs) because yeah you'd be right if you were saying that Now, you might have an older phone, and we all know after the Apple debacle that one thing about an aging phone is that battery is going to start to give way, and your performance is just going to be shot to hell. Now, Verizon, they say, hey, don't worry about that. We've got a great solution. Verizon Support says you should turn off 5G to save your phone's battery. Uh, What? They actually didn't say that. They said turn on LTE. But you know what happens when you turn on LTE? 5G goes away. Right. <laughs> they didn't mention anything about 5G in the press release. So yeah, 5G, you know that thing that we've been talking about for two years is supposed to be like the greatest thing in the world? It kills your battery. Yeah. Which is kind of nuts because, you know, there's a lot more 5, 5G microcells. So theoretically, you should require less RF energy to get from A to B. But the reality is that it's not as efficient. Now you might assume, it's like, well... Is that the 5G is worse or did Verizon just do something stupid? Well, surely the Verizon engineers wouldn't make a mistake like that. Yes. I mean, that is an overwhelming mistake. Surely they couldn't do that. They're going to blame that on an intern. But when you read a story like this, and (laughs) one of the comments here on Ars Technica was great. It was like, wow, this really helps me with my imposter syndrome. (laughs) And it really does. Because, boy, this is stupid. Hacker reduces GTA online load times by roughly 70%. He did it with a debugger and by working in assembly. You got to go read this article. It's so cool if you're into this kind of stuff. Basically, the online store has a big catalog of all the items as a JSON file. And the parsing, they're doing JSON parsing in C, but they did it the least efficient way possible with like an in factorial algorithm that doesn't even need to, like they have a hash map that they're not even using. And so the dude patched all that and it reduced the the GTA online load time by 70%. But I will say this in defense of the Rockstar devs. I am, 
90%, I would bet 90% certainty here that this came from the marketing team. Probably. Because it's the store. It's the <laughs> online store. They're adding the microtransactions. Yeah. I love it when marketing people are like, let me do programming. And it's like, you have no idea what you don't know. And it's going to end badly for all of us. I mean, they still did quite well with it. You think they'll adopt this? They did. Yeah. They're going to be like, oops, and they're going to fix it. I hope so. <clears throat> I hope they don't also ban that guy from GTA for violating something. Because <laughs> that's the kind of thing that they could do. No good deed goes unpunished. This one, uh, moving on to uh, social media, this is terrifying because it shows that the public has some idea of the danger that they're in, but in some cases are completely blind to it. A little bit of boiling frog here. Facebook, TikTok are the least trusted by Americans, but Google is the most trusted, says survey. You think uh, think Zuckerberg's grinding his teeth? Show Show the chart. But Google is the most trusted? I mean, come on. Well, it's 65%. So, 21% of people are like, I don't trust Google or Amazon or Microsoft or Apple. For me, the surprising one was really Amazon. It's like, people trust Amazon? Like, Amazon is literally destroying small business and small business is America. And two-thirds of Americans trust Amazon? How about TikTok under Huawei? A lot of people seem to be using it, though. So, yeah, they talked about, uh, and 62% think social media companies need more regulation. So, it's the people are kind of crying out for more restrictions and control. And Again, there's good money to be made in dishonesty. As long as that's true, these problems are just symptoms. Well, that's never going to change. No. Don't trust any of them. They're all evil. And if you want some indication of that, remember when they all came out with these big press releases and they're like, listen, it's not about profits to us. It's about the health of this country. And toward that end, we're going to clean up your feed. We're going to keep the misinformation down. We're banning political ads. And everybody was just like, oh, they're so wonderful. Oh, they're so great. Well, they had a couple of months to look at how that affected their bottom line. Facebook has lifted the political ad ban. Well, it's lifting, I think, this Friday, which by the time you watch this is... Oh, no, it's just a few days away. So, yeah, you can do political ads on Facebook again. Now, remember the article that we did last week where they talked about political ads were still happening. Oops. And the article that we did a week before that, which was political ads are still happening. Oops. So when they said that they had stopped... They just really slowed down. Slightly. They hadn't really stopped at all. And now... Open it all back up. <laughs> but we saved democracy, right? You know, uh, on to Facebook's credit, I never saw any slowdown from Google. You know, there were some sites that I went to that had all kinds of like crazy video ad words. I think they mentioned that Google, I mean, you know, like you say, they never actually did it, but they did announce they were going to do it, but they came back faster than Facebook did. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, we talked about Parler, one of the other social media right-wing things, the controversial ones, was Gab. And uh, Gab was supposed to be this alternative to Twitter and all that stuff, you know, similar to Parler. But in there, they might have had the right idea of, like, go and build your own thing, but they made some mistakes along the way. <laughs> Let's talk about Ruby. <laughs> Far-right platform Gab has been hacked, including private data. One line, the, the apparently the CTO inserted one line, which uh, was the line that filters out user content. Just trust user content. It's fine. It was not fine. I messed up that sort. Pretend you didn't see that previous article. <laughs> Rookie coding mistake prior to Gab hack came from site's CTO. So yeah, this is a Ruby, Ruby on Rails, and you can see the commit right here. This is what did it. <laughs> It's really just the one line, just the uh, uh, the reject. So that prevented the anti SQL injection, and the security researcher was very easily able to get in with SQL injection and steal everything. And he's going to give it all out, which people are kind of celebrating this. Like, yeah, those evil people give their data away, but is that legal? What if you're just stupid? Like the people that are just stupid, I think are victims. 
Yeah, but a stupid person, even without ill intent, can do a lot of damage. That's true. We, so what? So what do we do with them? Uh, feel sorry for them and wait for them to <laughs> destroy. <laughs> wait for them to destroy society. How would you write the epitaph to that society? Engagement challenge. I don't think there'd be anybody to write it. <laughs> And uh, Facebook, people, you know, more and more, especially during the pandemic, are going on to Facebook to buy and sell things. We're getting back to bartering. Isn't that wonderful? And you can get almost anything on there. <laughs> Amazon Rainforest Plots sold via Facebook Marketplace ads. So these are Rainforest Plots that are not supposed to be for sale. They're supposed to be protected. The indigenous people would like to protect it. But, uh, you know, Facebook Marketplace, you can buy a lot of rainforest. This is... Uh, truly the darkest timeline and this is what they do with it they slash and burn it and turn it into cattle land i don't understand though because they pointed out in this article that the people selling it don't have any rights to it so what exactly are they selling just they don't have titles is this the old sell you a bridge could be squatters rights kind of a thing but there's no there, there's no development on it it's farmland it's still doing a lot of damage, though. Like once it's not rainforest anymore. Yeah, well, that's the one thing the guy, the one guy did. He went in and did the slash and burn himself, and then he would sell that. But what would stop me from just moving in there while he's not there? Nothing, probably. Armed conflict. Yeah, armed conflict. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we have some uh, Amazon viewers who can tell us exactly how that works. Over in Turkey, they have definitely had a contentious relationship with social media in the past. They're not big fans of it, especially when people have the ability to, you know, speak their mind on it. But even beyond that, they're a little bit more worried about what's going on in other parts of the world that might look badly on them on social media. Sheryl Sandberg and top Facebook executives silenced an enemy of Turkey to prevent a hit to the company's business. Because that's just how business is done in Turkey. Pay attention to this, because this is not just like dirty dealing in Turkey, blah, blah, blah. This is the level of behavior that we can expect from companies, not just Facebook. I'm not singling out Facebook. In a global theater. If Facebook, you know, is asked to hush somebody up for China, clearly they're willing to do that. Now, the YPG is a, I guess you call them a militia group. They're the Kurds. They're not big fans of Turkey and vice versa. And they operate in Syria, so obviously, you know, it's a... But weren't we supporting them with military resources? It's interesting that you brought that up. <laughs> so, is Turkey... I, can't, I never remember. Turkey's either in the UN or in NATO. Is it NATO? Uh, we're getting off. I don't know. So, anyway, Turkey is our ally. That's what I'm getting at. The YPG is a bitter, bitter enemy of Turkey. They are kind of at war. It's that whole Syrian proxy thing. On Valentine's Day, guess who sent a ton of loaded trucks to the YPG <laughs> full of weapons? <laughs> we did. It was the U.S. military. Yeah. We trained them and we did all kinds of stuff. And then we kind of abandoned them, which is really bad because that means that there's going to be a lot of terrorists in the not too distant future that remember what we did. But that means we've got a base somewhere in Syria a forward base and then we've got the uh is it in Serlik air base in turkey and then facebook is is like you know it's cool we'll just delete that <laughs> yeah facebook they they just do whatever the government's telling them to do i doubt the ypg has enough of a like a government arm to pressure facebook so of yeah. course they lose i'm not going to pretend to know which is the correct dog in that fight? <laughs> I don't. I don't know that there is one. Maybe not. But there's. I, I guarantee you that a lot of innocent people have suffered needlessly. Certainly in Syria, because you know we've started bombing them again. <laughs> let's not talk about that, as you say. <laughs> I don't want to laugh at that. Well, let's talk about something that is much more palatable and that almost everybody likes. Reddit CEO: The platform doesn't plan to ban. Adult content skirting the filter, he said. <laughs> <laughs> There's an article here on Axios. You can uh, look at that. See that because Reddit has taken steps to make that kind of stuff a little bit more annoying. Like if you're on the web version, I think it asks you to install the app, which you know is loaded with trackers and all sorts of other bad things. There is a uh, a toggle mm -hmm. in your settings. You can turn that off. Uh, I don't even log into Reddit, so 
Well, if you don't log into Reddit, you get the default front page, which is just leftist propaganda. Come <laughs> on. I've only bookmarked the subreddits I like. So, But uh, I, we are entering into a crazy world yeah. where so many girls have OnlyFans accounts. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But uh, the stigma, that's got to destroy the stigma after 10, 15 years, right? I would think. And yet... Yeah, they point out Twitter is also not banning that content. They're going to let it go. They still, uh, Twitter definitely suppresses the crap out of it. So, which is fine. But, just because they let you get away with it, doesn't mean it won't have other impacts in your life. (laughs) Mom speaks out. Uh, Mom speaks out after school finds her OnlyFans account and expels her sons. It's body shaming and it's bullying. So, yeah, this was a Catholic school. She had some kids enrolled in Catholic school, and she has an OnlyFans account and whatever. But that's not the disturbing thing. The disturbing thing is that the other parents, like one of them apparently printed out all of the pictures on her OnlyFans, which meant they needed to subscribe, and sent it in an information packet to the principal along with a, you know, a letter and some other stuff to be like, no, she has, you know, her children have to be expelled. This is a terrible influence blah 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 i don't you know with where we are economically and like you know the brotherhood of humanity and like that everyone is suffering right now i really don't know what would compel somebody to be that upset about this kind of a thing like you could be sad that somebody's having to do that to survive or be sad that somebody just wants to do that because they enjoy it but there's no reason to like make somebody's like make somebody suffer for having done that. That's not your uh, job. Let me explain to you really, really quickly. Real simple. Uh, socially advocated lifelong indoctrination. That's what does that. Yeah. But if you're in this line of work and you are obviously, you know, more liberal in your views about that kind of thing, why are you letting theists educate your children? Hmm. Not to mention, by the way... <laughs> have you seen public schools? <laughs> well, have you seen what happens to kids at Catholic schools? <laughs> it's two different kinds of evil. What's going on? I think I'll take the bad education. <laughs> I can fix that myself. <laughs> they, I don't know if... Maybe this Yahoo story didn't point it out. Did you see... I think it said she was making like hundred and fifty grand a month. Yeah, that's probably... I, don't, I saw that, but I thought that had to be a typo or something. Uh, per year, but even a year, that's yeah, that's not bad. Now, her and her husband put out what she described as relatively tame content, <laughs> but that's a lot of money. It it wouldn't last. She's so. uh, it's not a bad looking gal, you know. But like I say, it wouldn't it it wouldn't last. So you know, I don't know. I don't I don't understand that. Uh, whole dynamic but i think a lot of guys like that personal connection oh yeah so they won't it's it's not as uh you know like on twitch if you go offline for 10 seconds they're like well there's plenty of other ones to watch <laughs> i think you develop a sort of a relationship with your only fans girls uh certainly that's true of our patrons you know some of our patrons have been with us since the beginning and and they'll definitely mm-hmm. reach out and do all that kind of stuff so thank you for that so you're basically calling our patron simps well, they kind of, <laughs> in the best possible way, thank you. It's nice of you. We love you. Uh, but uh, be careful if you are on OnlyFans. Don't assume that no one's going to find you. How about the fact that the other, the parent, the father that found her, what was he doing on there? <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's like. Is he, is that not the same, I mean, maybe not the same level of violation, but isn't he also violating ethics? Some people thrive on, on the drama of it, and that, there's a lot of that in play here, obviously, because, you know, being a theistic school, there's probably a lot of repression, and this is just. I don't think he went to OnlyFans to stir drama. I think he went <laughs> to do something else. <laughs> Show me people nearby. Oh. <gasps> I don't think OnlyFans has like a geographic search. That would be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. All right. What do we got for Friday? Friday we got uh, whatever we haven't done yet, which is robots and nonsense, right? Nice. We got a lot of nonsense this week. See you then. Bye. Bye.